got it. All right, hello and welcome everyone to the Where Do We Go From Here? Reaching Young Patrons Post-Pandemic Webinar. We'll get started with introductions and the presentation in just a moment. But first I have a couple of announcements. Uh, to register for other webinars or trainings available from the Professional Development Office, see the Indiana State Library's events calendar, which can be found on our website at www.in.gov slash library. And then it's under services for libraries. This session is one hour and you're eligible to receive one LEU for this presentation. If you're watching a recording of this webinar, uh, instructions on how to obtain your LEU are in the video's description on YouTube, as well as on the ISL's continuing education site under LEU policies. But the brief version is that when you watch a recorded webinar, your director or someone in HR should create a certificate for you as they're the ones who can verify that you watch. Okay, I think we are ready to get started. So you can already see my screen. So yeah, welcome. Where do we go from here? Reaching young patrons post pandemic. My name is Beth Yates. I'm the children's consultant at the Indiana State Library in our professional development office. And my co-presenter today is Christy Franzman. She's the teen engagement coordinator at the Hamilton East Public Library. And both of us have been working together for almost two years now on this project. It is a national initiative to rethink teen services that comes from YALSA, and they train Christy and I on the topics that we're gonna be discussing today. But rest assured, this topic can apply to all ages. So we're not just talking about teens today. Although if it creeps into our language sometimes, that's why. Welcome for today. We are hoping you're gonna leave here today with um, at least one new strategy for reaching youth uh, using community asset mapping. And from that, at least one idea for a new connection in your community. And what's always fun is examples from other libraries um, that use this to maybe serve as some inspiration, to spark some ideas and get you motivated. So 2020 and really 2021 also, we're almost to this year, which is impossible to believe for me. But um, obviously this past year and a half or more has been very interesting, um, but don't worry, we're not going to spend a lot of time rehashing the past year. Um, we are going to be spending most of this session instead talking about how you can reach kids who maybe stopped coming to the library this past year, year and a half, or maybe you didn't even have them prior to COVID. Um, but before we talk about new ways to reach youth, we do want to look back at the past year and a half and think about what maybe did work for you. Did you have any successful strategies for reaching kids? Um, did you have success with virtual programs, with take-home kits? Is there anything you're thinking you're going to continue? If you did, share that in the chat with us right now. We'll give you a moment. You want to hear positive things first. Yeah. yeah. Work. <laughs> Book bundles. Nice. Take and makes for sure. Me too. Mm -hmm. All right. And Sarah, are you the Sarah from New York? Virtual gaming programs. <laughs> take and makes, take and makes. Lots of take and makes people are gonna continue with. Oh, with homeschool programs, okay. Online bedtime stories. I love that. Yeah, that's a fun idea. Anything else successful? Kids coding, block party, outside, outdoor stuff, right? Kids trivia. Mindfulness Minute, I like the sound of that. Online SAT prep, nice. These are all fantastic. Christy, you had some examples too, right? Yeah, um, so a couple of mine that were successful during the pandemic and then we've actually continued it because, you know, 
Um, first off is our tab. We had a pretty good tab going um, at Fisher's and kind of a small one here at Noblesville trying to build up. So we started virtual, of course, over 2020. And the TAB members actually voted to stay together, both Fishers and Noblesville, and to continue on virtual. Um, you know, TAB advisory boards vary from library to library. Ours in particular um, are very academic into their academics. They often have a lot of other activities that they're involved in. Um, and so remaining virtual, they overwhelmingly voted for, I think was more convenient for them and also a way to keep our two tab groups together. So that has been awesome. Um, the other one is Dungeons and Dragons. I have never played D&D. I was so intimidated by it. If you've ever looked at the rule book and all that, it's a lot, but bit the bullet um, last year, learned about it, learned how to use Roll20, which is we can play online and it really worked out and um, it, it's been a lot of fun. We've gotten some new teens um, that we've met some, and their regulars that come back. Um, so both of these programs are successes, but you'll notice that a tab and D&D &D are not really large number programs and they're not supposed to be. They're supposed to be kind of smaller group, but that wasn't really how we measured the success. The success was the kids participating in TAB, volunteering, giving, you know, lending their voices uh, and ideas. Um, the success of D&D &D was, of course, you know, meeting new teens, reaching new teens, but also the teamwork that they used together working um, towards, you know, a quest, the creativity that is totally a part of D&D. Um, has been very successful. So I count those as wins, even if the numbers weren't huge. Absolutely. And I mean, I think that goes along with, you know, we've discovered, if we didn't already know that, over the past year and a half, that statistics are not really a good marker for a success, successful program, or it's not a good indication of whether you've had an impact. Um, so I think that's wonderful. Yeah, you got to look at those other social emotional skills and things that you're imparting. So thanks for sharing that. Um, we did have someone mention um, that they are doing a virtual Dungeons and Dragons um, to bridge young adults to college. So Taylor, if you want to share more about that in the chat, um, we're going to go ahead. But I know at least Sarah was wondering if you could share more about it. That would be awesome. OK, so. We want to stop and think for just a minute, um, kind of take the bigger picture into account. Why do you offer programming? Why do libraries offer programming? Um, does your library have a goal for your programming? Uh, what are the reasons that you offer it in the first place? Like, what's the purpose of programming? Um, kind of the bigger, deeper question about why we do what we do, but specifically about programming. So. Let me know, yeah, in the chat, why you offer programming at your library. If your library has like a strategic plan um, or a mission statement or something, share that. But if not, just tell me what you think. And Amanda says to reach all of our patrons, uh, to meet the needs of our patrons, says Karen. Anyone else? To build community, ooh, I like it. To provide access to new skills and entertainment. Yes. To get people in the door, promote materials and circulation. To teach early lit skills, connecting people together for community. Share our resources. And ultimately, like these are all wonderful reasons to do programming, right? And ultimately, at the heart of it, what are we doing? We are serving our community. We are serving our patrons. Someone said giving them what they need or what they, um, what they want. Um, but in some way, we're trying to serve our patrons. That's kind of the heart of it. So that could be imparting new skills, experiencing new things that they wouldn't have a chance to experience otherwise, um, exposing them to new literature or books, um, movies, whatever, music. 
Our goal is weekly in-person programming, which we're now doing. Share our resources. Okay, so um, if your library has a strategic plan, that's great or a mission, you should have a strategic plan. But if you have a mission and goals about programming, that's fantastic. If you don't know whether you do, or if you don't, then it's definitely a conversation that you might want to have with your colleagues, with your director, your supervisor, whoever at your library so that you can really get some focus um, and some direction behind your programming. And I believe Christy has an example of that. Yeah, so this is Hamilton East Public Library. We serve Noblesville and Fishers. Um, near central Indianapolis, for those of you not familiar, uh, near central Indiana, sorry, suburbs of Indianapolis. And um, this is just an example to kind of look. Um, and so our ideas live here. It's kind of like our little slogan. Um, and then it lists our, you know, what, a, what we believe that a public library should be. And so we wanted to highlight that very first one because it's a dynamic contributor the Fishers Noblesville community. So a dynamic contributor, not just, you know, a building full of books. We want to contribute to our community. Then the actual mission and vision are pretty short and sweet as, you know, they should be. The mission is to be our community's essential connector to information and need. Vision is a connected library in a connected community. So what I like about this is you'll notice that it says community a lot, it says connect or connected a lot. And that's what I really like about that. It, all of our things, it's very community focused. The library is a part of community. Um, the other thing that's not on here is we have uh, what we call guiding principles and it spells out idea, super cute. It stands for innovation, innovation, sorry, innovation, discovery, equality, and accessibility. And I like that under innovation in particular, it says we embrace and accept the idea that we change every day to respond to the needs of our community. And I really like that a lot is that we change to respond to the community's needs because those are always changing. So keeping that in mind, Um, so, yeah, so if we're trying to make an impact in our communities, like Christy was saying, then we need to work with our communities, right, both inside and outside of the library's walls. And this is an especially good time to refresh and reinvent how we do things, because over the past two years, the world has changed the way that it operates. I know libraries have also changed a lot of things about the way that they operate. But it's also a good chance to look back and say, why are we doing these things? Just because we've always done it that way, just because we've always programmed in this way, or we've always considered this to be our goal to get people in the doors. Um, you know, maybe we need to think of things differently. So um, we need to think about what are the needs of the youth in our communities now? We know that we still need space for youth. We still need activities and collections that appeal to youth. We still need to be able to promote to youth. Um, but aside from those things, that stuff, what do the youth in our communities need? Does anyone have any thoughts about it? You can put them in the chat. And not specifically from the library. I guess I should clarify that too. Just generally, what do our youth need? Space outside of the home and school, yes. Social skills, uh-huh. Especially this past year, yes, good point. Trusting adults, yeah, someone outside of their parents. I um, mean, it's always good if they have someone else they feel like they can talk to, because even if you have a great relationship with your parents and you're a teen, you might still not feel totally comfortable kind of like revealing you know, deeper inner thoughts to them. You need someone else to, to share those things with um, and that can potentially help you if you need that help. Um, let's see, to feel included and to explore their passions and potentials. Library programming right there, right? Um, can help with those things. A safe place to express themselves. 
Places to try new things without pressure of grades. Yes, tutoring for sure, potentially. Yeah, these are all wonderful. Wonderful things that our teens absolutely and younger kids absolutely need. Um, the safe space, especially the place to be with peers, um, the low pressure environments versus school, exposure to different kinds of people and ideas. Yes, thank you, Sarah, great one. Early literacy skills and caregiver education for younger, yeah. For parents, especially, I, we, when we say youth, really we're probably talking about parents when we're talking about the youngest to kids. Um, early literacy skills and caregiver education. And the library can potentially help with all of those things. I like their saltwater fish tank, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, so once we identify, you know, what are the needs of the youth in our particular communities and what do youth and teens need, you know, in general, um, how? How do we reach the patrons in order to meet those needs? So, um, you know, we're going to say, go to them. That's a good one that we, if you weren't doing it before, you might have learned <laughs> over this last year is get outside the library. Go to uh, where they are. Where are your patrons? Where is the audience that you're looking for? Um, you know, and, and we understand, um, you know, Beth's worked in public libraries. I am work in public library. And we know that that takes some maneuvering sometimes. It's convincing, you know, your supervisor, reprioritizing desk time and other duties as assigned, right? Um, so one of those things is maybe even cutting programs or reducing the number of other programs after, you know, you evaluate them if you want to try something new. Um, in particular here, we were doing like monthly movies and monthly games and stuff like that. And while those are beneficial, I mean, those have their, their merits, they are beneficial. They weren't doing as well in my particular libraries. So we decided to make those more of like quarterly or during breaks or something special that maybe would get more kids together and make it even more beneficial. But it also then freed up some staff time so that we could try new things and do other things including getting outside of the library. Um, you can also find new patrons by, by getting out and partnering, partnering up with other places and organizations and groups that are working with the same audience you're working with. Um, schools, librarians, you know, we youth librarians, we know to connect with the schools. 4-H um, clubs, um, the YMCA, systems of care. And if you don't know who your systems of care are, it is on the government, the Indiana government website. Um, in Indiana, we have regional coordinators. So all regions of Indiana are covered. And there's also a place where you can search for your local coordinator of your systems of care. And pretty much what they are, there are they are the organizations that are working for the youth mental and behavioral health in your area, um, whether it covers addiction, suicide prevention, um, you know, people in, in the justice system, youth in the justice system. So reach out to them because they're working with youth. They're even working with um, maybe some marginalized youth or youth, you know, that really need that extra benefits and resources that we can provide. Um, we had some QPR training. If you're not familiar with suicide prevention, it's question, persuade, and refer is what QPR stands for, and it takes it instead of like an educational class about suicide prevention, it's how to train. So you can train other youth and adults of how to help prevent suicide. So that came out of um, my hooking up with our, our local coordinator for systems of care. Um, also just ask your teens. That's a great way to find out where they are hanging out, what they're doing, what they're interested in. Um, the, the pictures you see, we, we did yoga with goats this last summer, and that came out of a tab meeting. And I'm pretty sure the team was joking, like, I wanna, I'd only do yoga if it were with goats. And uh, so I looked around, and we had a farm up just north of Noblesville that did yoga with goats. So this past summer, when we were not comfortable being indoors, you know, kind of forced us to look outside. And that came from a teen idea and it was well attended and um, it, it went really, really well. Um, 
so that was just one of those, you know, things that we did over the summer. But ask your teens, even if you don't have a strong, consistent tab, teen showing up for tab, ask the one to come into the building. Surely you have some regulars that you see. Find out, you know, where they're going in their free time. Find out what they're interested in doing, what they wish they could do. See if you can make it happen. So how do we find other community groups to partner with, Beth? Well, I will answer that in just one minute. Oh. Um, we did have a question. <laughs> they wanted to know, did the teen who said that show up? She didn't, but other TAB members did. She didn't because we actually ended up hiring her <laughs> to be our summer intern. So she was working at the library, um, I believe, on those days. And they were also on, yeah, it was her Saturday shift. So, <laughs> Got but it. I know what you're saying, and that happens <laughs> a lot. It absolutely happens. Yeah. yeah. But no, well, we just yeah, you, might, <laughs> you might have other teens show up. The other yeah. thing I wanted to mention, I realized I don't think we've said this yet, um, but I just want to remind folks that there's there's always traditionally been a real push to get people into the library. And what we're kind of saying here is being in the library is not the most important thing because you're still providing a service to your patrons, even if it's outside of the library's walls. So just keep that in mind. Um, I know sometimes that can also be a struggle because the board or maybe your director feels like it's really important to have bodies in the building, but you can still be providing. In fact, you might even be able to provide services better to your community if you're not always just in the library. Okay, so Oops, just another reason to point back to your mission statement, vision statement, check out your current strategic plan that your library has and see if it ever says, you know, in the library, because <laughs> if it doesn't, then you can use that to help back up your idea. Totally. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so back to Christy's question. How do we find community groups to partner with like that? Because that's a big question that we get too. Um, well, that's what this whole webinar is really about. It's about something called community asset mapping, because we believe that you can discover and develop new partners in your community by using this strategy, so to speak. Um, so what is it exactly? Well, logistically speaking, first of all, if you've heard of it, let us know in the chat. Um, some of you probably have, um, but if you haven't heard of it, logistically speaking, Asset mapping is literally making a map of the assets around your community, whether that is an actual map, like a map map, or it could be a diagram, a chart, even a list of the places in your, in your area. Um, and then to create that list or map, you can literally just walk around your neighborhood. You can drive around maybe with a partner who's like looking out the window. You notice things Bless that- you that you don't always notice. If you can make sure you're muted, that would be fantastic, thank you. Um, you notice things that you might not normally notice if you're really, really looking. So you create this map or this list or this diagram. Um, and the goal here is to find the strengths and the assets that already exist in your community. And by the way, that can also include people. People can also be assets. In fact, they're usually some of your best assets. So by doing that, you're taking a close look at your area, you're noticing what strengths you already have, who else might be serving the same audience that you want to serve, and then you're hopefully going to work together with that group to better your community. Um, so you're asking things like, are the kids or teens going to any of these places that I'm looking at after school? Um, if they are, can I connect with them there? Would any of the local businesses be potential programming partners? And not just like, oh, they can come in and do one program, but they could be more than that. Um, maybe you could introduce teens to new interests and even professions if you network with some of the business owners in town. So last spring, we did a training called Impacting Lives, A New Approach to Teen Services. It was part of that YALSA project. And we spent part of that time with the group talking about asset mapping. So we'd like to share now a few examples with you from the group. They gave us permission to share these examples. And you'll see big and small libraries created these maps, as well as different floor maps for the map 
formats for the maps themselves. Um, some of them are actual maps, real maps, but most of them are abstract. And I also want to point out that while all of these are focused on teen services, because that was the specific audience we were discussing at the time, you can use these for any audience. You can scale it up or down, you can get specific with one age group, or you can look at your entire community. Um, you can look for one particular reason or just as a general, uh, see what's out there. Um, this can really work great with strategic planning, by the way, too. So if your library is going through strategic planning, like a five-year, three-year plan, keep this in mind as something to consider using. Okay. Here are our examples. Okay. Yeah, so the first one we have uh, was someone from the Clinton Public Library here in Indiana. And they just separated theirs, as you can see, in four kind of broad categories. So you had physical assets like parks and ball fields, the community centers. Um, you have local economy. So everything from the local IGA, the post office, to a restaurant, taco, tequila sounds awesome. Um, <laughs> then you have associations like your Masonic Lodge, your scout troops, 4-H, churches, hospitals. And then individuals, parents, students, teachers, coaches, retirees, librarians. Um, so that is, that is one way to do it. I like this one in particular for the connection ideas. I know it's kind of small print, but if you can't read it, it just says connection ideas, life classes, such as hair salons, candle making, simple house repair, car repair. So they're already starting to generate some ideas. I will say with all of these that Beth and I are going to show you, because we have this same suggestion for each one, I think, is that we would go further. I mean, these are ones that they shared with us to share out. But when you're doing your own and you're, you're looking at it for your organization, we recommend that you go further and put down, write down the actual names of people that you know or have contact with at each of those places. Get more specific so you have that and you can keep it kind of a, a living document as people change, you know, staff changes different places and keep those, um, those contacts listed because it's great to know what you have, but it's really great to know who you can contact <laughs> to get connected. Yeah, and I think that's one of the roadblocks for a lot of folks is it's like, okay, well, I need to get in touch with the schools, but who at the schools do I talk to? I don't know, could I start with the school librarian, the principal, the superintendent? Do I just reach out to some classroom teachers? Do I know someone who's a teacher there? Um, so yeah, for sure. Um, this one is Anderson Public Library. And I like that on this one, they have listed the organizations and then they've actually started to say what they could potentially do with that organization. This is um, on the small side, um, but for instance, there's the Animal Protection League, Humane Society, and they say crafts for donations or a speaker. So right there, there's two possible program ideas um, that they've come up with for that one location. This is so pretty. I like color coordination. So these are color coordinated. Um, they also, again, broad categories. The one thing I like about this one though is the associations and institutions are separated instead of all under one thing. And the icons kind of help define that in a way, like institutions would be like, these are actual buildings, you know, places where there are people, whereas associations are groups of people, like your, your, your scouts, your rotary club, park pals, sounds really cool. Um, Friends of Newburgh. This is an Ohio Township Public Library. And um, so yeah, so they have it all divided out. They have the icons. Um, what's kind of different and cool about this one is the little map that they've included of their service area. And so I think that's, that's a nice touch just to kind of see where, you know, you might even put those on there. Where, where are those things? But yeah, the little map of their service area, as well as going through and splitting them out into categories. This one is the St. Joseph County Public Library. That's like the South Bend area if you're from Indiana. Um, and so it's a larger city and you can see their population is almost 300,000. So for this particular map, I really like that this person um, actually 
just chose their branch and then they looked in that area just around them. And then additionally, I like that they've written action items. Again, it's pretty small for you, but just know that those things on the lines are action items like um, partner with teachers or school librarians for programming, offer meeting room for meetings, things like that. Just have, they've written notes for themselves um, to remember what they want to talk about. Then, on the other hand, for those of you coming from small libraries, here is Flora Monroe Township Public Library with population of a whopping 2,000 people. And they made, a, literally just went to Google Maps and plotted out, you know, where they have, there's Kathy from Flora, we love it, we love your examples, um, where they have, they've used icons and what the symbols you know, represent. I love that their legend also includes people. Who do they know from there? The organization, like what it is included in there. Um, and then what is the asset, which is interesting. So like what, what, what is the purpose? What is the asset of, of partnering with these places? So I like that if you're more of a geographical <laughs> looking to visual type of person, this one worked out. But look how many there are. For a population of 2,000, that's quite a few on their community asset map. So that's really cool to see. Sorry. All right. So, um, yeah, very vastly different sizes. So you can see it works for any size. Um, and since Kathy is here, she can correct us if we've gotten the stories wrong. But I'm going to share the Flora Library is actually one of our favorite examples because it's a good example of the energy and the momentum that you can experience after doing asset mapping. You, they, they got really excited. Um, Kathy Butcher and our colleague Macy Ropes from the Flora Library um, finished their map and they went right to their director. They, it is a small library, so they have easy access to her. Um, and they completed their map um, and talk to their director about how they could get started right away. So I think that's fantastic. Uh, when I talked to Kathy in, it was, gosh, like uh, July or August, Kathy reported to me that since March, they've actually contacted almost everyone on their contact list, which is amazing. And one of their more successful uh, partnerships has been a new one with their local elementary school. Um, Kathy saw that the school was doing a one school one read event and they previously hadn't been aware of that but once they were they were able to reach out to the principal and they really elevated that programming by offering prizes at the public library so you know the children were motivated to to read the books but then also they could come in and get prizes which made it more exciting um, and she said that it really drove traffic back into their library in the late spring when they were just finally opening up again. Um, they also, on the picture on the right, were able to bring the entire fifth grade in. I think they were in batches, three different groups, um, and they did a book tasting program with them in the library. Um, so that's the picture there. You can see they were able to try all different types of books or taste them. So those two were examples were getting kids into the library, um, which is great. And another way, we have some examples of how they went outside of the library. It kind of started with um, looking at their teen advisory group. It used to be a teen advisory board. They decided to kind of rebrand it and made it a teen club instead. And that was able for, uh, they were able to get in like, what they say, six to 10 teens who visit every week to be more consistent on that teen club. And they actually planned the program on the left, uh, help plan, is a foam party at their local county fair, and which was also through another community partnership with the Flora Community Club. So there was an example of, first of all, Bill, getting rebranding something that maybe you had kind of lost, which is a great idea, and then getting the teens involved to plan it and using a, for, a partnership to go out into the community and, and put it on. So like hitting all the hitting all the things there, it's great. The example on the right is really cool too. They went out uh, to a local community center and did the Leap Into Science program and they did an event there. And it went really well that the community center started bringing in their groups 
to the library once a week. So it kind of went both ways, win-win partnership and situation, which is, is really cool. So those are some great examples. Um, and we wanted to point out this one first, like Beth said, Flora, they were motivated and they just, you know, hit the ground running. The other reason is because it's such a small community, it's only 2000 people. And before we did the training, the spring cohort, I think, you know, we had heard from a lot of libraries because a lot of libraries in Indiana are small. We have small communities and we heard from a lot of them like, we just don't have that much. You know, we don't have all the big um businesses and things like that. And I think after doing the asset mapping, it was really fun to see how surprised, how excited they were that they really do have a lot more than they think. And sometimes I think small communities maybe even have a little bit of an advantage in the way of connecting with people. Because you may already know, you know, the person who is running the whole shebang at the community center, maybe, you know, they're doing all the jobs there. Um, you may know a neighbor who is really good at quilting and maybe she would like to come in and do a program or, I mean, you just maybe have better chance of knowing the people and that's how you make the connections, right? It's great to have a lot of organi organizations and businesses, but it's awful hard if you don't know who to contact or you don't have some sort of in to get in there, so I just wanted to point that out for those small towns, you are still in a great position. <laughs> we have a few other examples, Beth. Yes, so a couple of other libraries that participated in our, uh, our previous training, Anderson Public Library, um, they've begun working with the Madison County Youth Center, which is the county detention center, which serves grades six through 12 there in months, or in uh, Anderson, sorry. Um, they've been visiting them twice a week and they work with the kids to decide what program they'll do each week based on the kids' preferences. Um, and what's really great about this is it's a group of kids that mostly um, have not been in the library before or they've, if they have been there, they've had negative interactions with the staff um, because of behavior. Um, so this has been a really excellent chance for them to reach out and they've actually changed perceptions of the library for a lot of those kids. Sorry, I was just like, oh, that's so great. Anyway, every time I hear that. Okay, so at Newburgh Chandler Public Library, they are planning a non-traditional career fair for teens. So think um, when their branch is not under construction, which I hear that we have both buildings, large buildings under construction at the same time. So I understand it's awful hard to plan something that you could potentially have a lot of people. Also, you know, pandemic. Um, but they're reaching out to local businesses like tattoo shops, hair salons, bakers, cosmetic shops, organic soap place, which sounds really cool that they have. And um, also working with a local high school and trying to, you know, connect kids with these, you know, cool careers that are out there that aren't necessarily um, you know, four-year college degrees, or maybe they have other special schools or certifications that are needed to do their job. And so hooking them up. And I, I love this. This is one that I've been thinking about kind of rolling around in my head for a while, got interrupted, obviously. But um, so I think that's really cool that they're thinking about that. It kind of motivated me to get back on that track <laughs> to start thinking about that too. So really neat. Oh, gosh, sorry. There we go. Um, and our last example is the Plainfield Public Library. Um, they had not been doing in-person programs. Um, and so rather than using asset mapping to draw more people into the building when they don't necessarily want more people there, um, they were actually using asset mapping to connect their existing teens to other community organizations so they can meet maybe outside of the library to do something. Yeah, I did. So oh, if we could mute, that would be great. Thank you. Um, they, so one of the projects was creating posters about pet safety and care for a local animal shelter. Um, they were also planning to have the owners of a local gaming store do a run or to, to do a Magic the Gathering tournament, like they were gonna run the tournament for the library. Um, so yeah, so great examples of connections in your community that could pay off now or they could pay off later whenever you're able to utilize them. 
Okay. So we sent out, oh, I also wanted to mention one other thing. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> so I wanted to mention, I sent out a handout when I sent the Zoom link for you all. Um, so if you have that, great. Um, if you don't, if you wanna open it up and take a look at it, you can. But at the bottom of one of the pages is these examples that we just told you. And the reason why we provided them to you all typed out is because we recognize that you are not always the folks who get to make all the decisions about how you'll spend your time. So if you need to convince an administrator or a supervisor of why it is valuable to do something like community asset mapping and to spend that time off the desk that it might require, then we've given you some potential success stories that you can say, look, here are other libraries right here in Indiana who've used it who have created some great new contacts and um, opportunities for their community to connect through this. So, so it's there for you. Hopefully it will help. Okay, also on the handout, um, you hopefully will have seen, we gave you kind of this outline of a diagram that you could use. It's based very much on the St. Joseph County one that we just showed you um, and what we're gonna do now is give you a couple of minutes, it's 2.16, so probably four, five minutes, because we wanna have time at the end to just sit with yourself, think about what connections you could start plugging into this. Um, of course, the way that you really do the best asset mapping is by, like I said, go for a walk, go for a drive, look at a map and see what's on your, your Google map in your area. Um, so that is really what we'll, we hope you will go do like after this training or in the future. But we also know that sometimes you have to get something down on paper so that you're more motivated to do it in the future. So that's what we're gonna do now. We're gonna give you a couple minutes. We're gonna mute ourselves and we want you to start writing stuff down. If you did not have a chance to print this form out, then just grab a pen and a piece of paper, make a list, make a drawing, whatever you wanna do. All right, so uh, it's 217. So we will come back in probably about 220, 221. Um, and we'll probably ask a few of you to share your examples if you're willing in the chat. I'm okay. gonna pause the recording. And if you are watching this later, go ahead and pause the video and take some time to fill out your app. All right. Hey, we're back. Um, we already have someone that shared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Librarian says, we have had excellent partnerships with our local state park, our local soil and water district folks, the extension office, just to name a few. That's awesome. We would like to invite everybody else to share if you wanna put them in the chat. Um, what, what are some things that you thought of a thought of right off the bat as you were starting to fill out your asset map. Churches, for sure. Friends who have home businesses, bath bombs, those are like, yeah. Soaps, et cetera, can partner with activities, also get their name out in the community. Yeah, that's great. Great. Cool and I was just going to say, as a reminder, I mean, that's a great example because the best partnerships are mutually beneficial, right? Yeah, exactly. Not just what they can do for the library, but, you know, what can the library do for other community members? Great. Lions sponsor a pizza party at Wana Pizza to form a team council and get their program. Oh no, I think Christy froze. Um, so I'll take over. <laughs> Let's see. So pottery studio in town, that is fantastic. I want to mention also that's a great example of, you know, they can do programs for you, but also if you have like a teen who is really into art and you find out they like pottery, you connect them with that person. Maybe they could do an internship there or have a day 
uh, a tour of their studio or something. Um, Kathy says, I recently talked to our local piano teacher. That's a great one. VFW, nice. I'm just skimming through these because everybody is offering up some great suggestions. Oh, Township Trustee. That could be a great partnership. 4-H teaming, oh yeah, 4-H, absolutely. And more yoga, awesome. That's fantastic. Sorry, I'm back, not sure what happened there. Children's Living have some SRP programs at an old mill that is nearby. The mill still works and they sell flour and other items there. Ooh, that's a wow. great idea. It is cool. And while you were gone, Christy, I went ahead and um, was calling out some of the ones above. Ooh, youth LGBTQ organizations. That's a great one. I missed that one. Nice. All right. All great examples. Well, so that we have time for questions, let's go ahead to our wrap up slide here. Yeah, so thanks to remember, first of all, like just step back, take a step back and look at the big picture. Why do you offer programs? Why does your library offer programs in the first place? Um, you know, and that was by what are the needs of the youth in your community or whatever audience that you're trying to reach? What are their needs? Um, it's great to keep what's working, you know, but what else can you do? What are new opportunities? Where can you reach youth outside of the library walls? Again, asset mapping is a great way to find that. Who can you partner with to achieve common goals and make those connections? And how can you reprioritize your resources? And this is the one that we wanted to mention again, because we know that, you know, we don't, we're not saying pile on more programs. Be kind to yourself, you know, look around. Do you, is there desk time you can get rid of? Is there a program that you can do less often or just scrap completely? Um, instead of piling on and stretching yourselves, kind of reprioritize and just to, so you allow some room to try something new. So. Questions? Yeah, that's, that's the end of our presentation. Any questions? And I am going to, I think we can go ahead maybe and stop the recording, Chris. Okay. But we can continue to take questions.